Today we're diving all the way into Mad Villainy, the collaboration between Mad Lib and MF Doom. Breaking down some of the samples, the production, the rhymes, the story behind this album, and seeing how Doom and Mad Lib's indifference toward hip hop is actually what makes this one of the best hip hop albums of all time. Let's take it from the top. Mad Villainy opens with The Illest Villains, which is essentially an instrumental skit. This feels like a continuation of MF Doom's debut album, Operation Doomsday, but this track feels like it's pulling Doom out of the comic book world and into the real world. I mean, for one, let's just compare album covers. Operation Doomsday is a straight up comic book, while Mad Villainy is this gritty photo of Doom himself. Throughout this album, there's voiceover from an old Fantastic Four cartoon, but on Mad Villainy, it's a more real world sounding voice. America's two most powerful villains of the next decade is turned loose to strike terror into the hearts of men. This is sampled from multiple sources, including a documentary history of the cult villains from 1989. But between this voice and the album cover photo, it feels like MF Doom, the hip hop supervillain here to destroy rap, has come into our world. Underneath this is a mix of chops, sound effects, organs, guitars, and more. It's a perfectly unsettling way to open the album, setting up what we're about to hear, a collaboration between MF Doom and Mad Lib. And actually, while Mad Lib produced this album, this opening is the only track that they both produced. We have so much more to cover on the story of this album, but let's keep moving to the first song on this album, Accordion. This album is revered as one of the greatest hip hop albums of all time, and the sources that Mad Lib pulls samples from is as wide as you could possibly imagine. For instance, this album by Daedalus, specifically the song Experience, because nothing says hip hop quite like accordion, right? But Mad Lib has taken this unusual sample and made it one of the most iconic opening songs ever. Madlib is an incredible producer who pulls from so many eclectic sources. This accordion sample is just the beginning. He's a master sampler, and there are many more examples we'll look at through this album of unique samples that Madlib rolls into his production. But suffice it to say, this is one of the craziest producers in the game, teaming up with one of the craziest MCs, MF Doom. We've looked at Doom's insane rhyming style in my breakdown of Operation Doomsday, but Doom continues his next level rhyming on this album. So many of his lyrics take multiple listens to fully unpack the references and connections. For example, here's part of his verse on accordion. I'm gonna isolate the vocal so we can focus on what he's saying. Just before this, he's talking about how he doesn't have a lot of time because people are after him, and he and Mad Lib are essentially living gods. They can destroy anyone, swords, a line about AIDS, drug fiends. Honestly, there could be a whole video just on the lyrics of this song. But anyway, then Doom says, That's why he bring his own needles and get more cheese than Doritos, Cheetos or Fritos. Slip like Freudian, your first and last step to playing yourself like accordion. Needles referring to drugs, but also record needles for sampling. Got it. But the next line, cheese means money, but the chips he lists, while well, they rhyme, Fritos doesn't have cheese in them. I mean, unless you're talking about chili cheese Fritos, but that doesn't fit rhythmically. But ultimately, none of this matters because in the next line, he tells us that he had a Freudian slip. That's where you accidentally say something you were subconsciously thinking. So Doom is rapping and dreaming about chips, mmm, um, food, foreshadowing. But then there's also slip like Freudian. A bluer slip is a type of hypodermic needle. This kind of dense wordplay is what Doom is known for. And he continues that on this album. And then we have the last line, your first and last step to playing yourself like an accordion. Are you kidding me? The man found a way to rhyme his way into the word accordion, which matches the sample we've been hearing. This dense rhyming continues on the next track, Meat Grinder. After the intro, we get the main beat. The main sample is from the song Hula Rock by Lou Howard and the All-Stars in 1975. So again, he's turning a hula-influenced 70s song into a raw-sounding hip-hop beat. Mad Lib's crazy. One of his superpowers is his seemingly endless list of music that he listens to. Hip-hop originally came out of funk and soul music. Through the 90s, we got the rise of jazz samples, but Mad Lib stretches this even further, pulling accordion samples, hula, Brazilian music, Indian music, and TV shows. Scores. We'll look at all of that in a moment, but first, 
Let's talk about Mad Lib's musical history. Mad Lib grew up in a musical household, his parents being musicians and his uncle being a jazz trumpeter. One of his early releases was with the group Loot Pack, which released their debut album in 1999 on Stone's Throw Records. In 2000, Mad Lib released a solo album under the name Quasimodo, but by 2001, he had become bored with hip hop. He then started releasing music under a new project, Yesterday's New Quintet. It's hard to call this one specific genre, but the biggest influence is jazz. For example, check this out. Now the rest of this album has soul influences and the way it's produced sounds very hip hop, but it's a unique mix of genres. Plus this quintet is fictional aliases. It's all Mad Lib, either chopping samples or playing live instruments. And while this is great music, the label Stone's Throw wanted to get Mad Lib back into hip hop. Egon Alipat, the former manager of Stone's Throw recalled, I was looking to do anything to kickstart his interest in hip hop. We had the chance to do a reunion album of Loot Pack. I got them weed, booked studio time, and it fizzled out. Madlib himself has said that he gets bored of hip-hop every few years and wants to do something different. Speaking of, here's the next track, Bistro. Ladies and gentlemen, now on this track, Doom himself debut grand opening of introduces all the characters on the album. Doom is himself a character who Daniel Dumoulin invented, but that whole story is in another video. Dumoulin has many characters that he raps as, including King Ghidra, Victor Vaughn. He introduces all of these as well as Mad Lib and his alter egos, Quasimodo and Yesterday's New Quintet. MF Doom is such an interesting person. Well, let, let me clarify, Daniel Dumoulin. MF Doom is a character that Dumoulin plays. And Dumoulin has a completely different approach to hip hop than many rappers, and one that angered a lot of fans when he was frank about it. In a 2019 interview with Spin Magazine, he was asked if he played any of Mad Villainy for his young son while they were making it. And he replied, nah, I would go to work and do the work. I don't really do music at home. We listen to music, but I do that just to get money. I write rhymes and to get money. Other than that, I don't listen to hip hop music. I listen to jazz music and instrumentals and like that. I only do this for the simple facts of points per rhyme. The point game. It seems to be a profitable thing these days and nobody else is really paying attention to it. You can be about your points and if nobody else can do it, you can get some change off that joint because you're the only one doing it like that. That's what I get out of the rhyming. This is a loaded quote that seems to go against everything hip hop stands for. He doesn't listen to hip hop and he's only in this for the money? Now the argument could be made that Dumoulin is embodying the super villain here and saying inflammatory things to get you riled up. But I'm gonna take him at his word when he says that he doesn't listen to hip hop and only does this for the money. I think this can be seen throughout Mad Villainy and is actually one of the things that makes this album so great. But back to the album let's talk about the song raid i love this song for multiple reasons madlib has an incredible ability to make separate samples sound like they're from the same song this opening piano riff is a bill evans sample and this gives way to the primary beat how do hold heat and preach non-violence he about stop speech come on silence this sample is obscure it's called america latina by osmar Melito from the soundtrack to a brazilian telenovela from the 70s i have a deep love Love for Brazilian music and Mad Lib made this beat on a trip to Brazil, one that would ultimately have dire consequences, but let me show you the sample. Man, I love this so much. But this beginning, it's in 3-4 times, so Mad Lib is chopping it up a bit, playing the first part of the beat, then repeating the rest of the three beats in order to fit the four beat groove. By the way, his gear setup, it's laughably simple. There's no big complicated studio, no expensive gear. Take a look at his setup. This song was made entirely with a portable turntable, a Boss SP-303, and a tape deck. In years since, Madlib has said that he makes beats on an iPad. Not a rough demo, but the full finished song. The album Bandana with Freddie Gibbs, all iPad. Anyway, Madlib's greatest skill is not his knowledge of complicated gear, it's his ear, his musical taste, his love of all kinds of music. In an LA Times article from 2002, shortly after the first Yesterday's New Quintet album, Madlib said, I didn't get in this to make a lot of money. I could do what the industry does. It would actually be easier than what I do now, but my brain and my heart won't let me. Interesting. Here's Madlib saying the opposite of the Doom quote we just looked at. Regardless, Madlib wasn't interested in making hip hop at the time anyway. But for this same article, the interviewer asked Madlib who his dream collaborators would be. He answered, Jay Dilla, and MF Doom. 
could this be the thing to get Madlib back into hip hop? But even so, how do you reconcile Doom's comments about how he doesn't listen to hip hop and just does this for the money? I mean, we know the ending because they made the album, but the larger question is, how is it that a producer and an MC who largely felt indifferent about hip hop, they teamed up and made one of the greatest hip hop albums of all time? America's Most Blunted is exactly what you think it's about. Essentially a funny tribute to cannabis. What's interesting though is the structure of the song. There are nearly 20 samples in here, primarily chopped up during the hook. It doesn't fully repeat, but this is one of the few times on the album that we have anything like a typical song structure. By and large, the songs on this album are just a verse all the way through with no part repeating. That feels like they're intentionally leaning away from the commercial approach, not worried about having a singable hook and focusing on the art aspect of it instead. The first verse is Doom, the second is Quasimodo, which is Mad Lib in two characters using two different voices. But between this and at the beginning, we've got the closest thing to a hook. This combination of the beat, all the samples, forming a hook together, this feels like a DJ Premier move. I love it. So the story goes that Egon Alipat took some Mad Lib beats and managed to indirectly send them to Doom, hoping that working with one of his stated dream collaborators would get him interested in hip hop again. Both of Mad Lib's dream collabs happened, by the way, with Dilla and Mad Lib forming J Lib and releasing Champion Sound in 2003. But right, so an agreement is made. Stone's Throw is gonna fly Doom out to LA to record on three Mad Lib beats. Doom's sort of manager negotiated for plane tickets and $1,500 for three songs. Stone's Throw was broke at this point, but managed to get the tickets. Peanut Butter Wolf picked up Doom from the airport, and after getting back to the rented house that was Stone's Throw headquarters, Doom and Madlib went downstairs to the bomb shelter, which sounds cool, but it's also a literal bomb shelter. Anyway, upstairs, Doom's manager cornered Alipat about the $1,500 and demanded payment. Alipat took his time stretching this interaction out so that Doom and Madlib could get acquainted, and wouldn't you know it, one of the first songs that came out of this project, the one playing from the bomb shelter at that moment, was this. It would appear as though the genius producer who'd lost his interest in hip hop and the MC who didn't listen to hip hop were forming a legendary connection. This album is unconventional in many ways. I mean, you've got just verses on most of the songs, no hooks except for like what we just looked at, and then you've got instrumental interludes that are all Mad Lib. These help break up the album and showcase what Mad Lib can do. And what he can do is crazy. Let's listen to the beginning of Figaro. The first part contains a sample from Lonnie Smith from 1967. Then it goes into the main beat, which has a sample from a different song from the same album. is empty with no brain but the clever nerd the best mc with no chain you ever heard i don't really have a way to explain how crazy that is the jazzy opening sets up one expectation for the song and then the main beat comes in slower harder and the contrast of the two is incredible. Strange Ways sees Doom rapping about more serious social and political issues, with the first verse focused locally and the second globally. He criticizes police who are interfering with a father doing what's necessary to feed his child and saying that in war, all you get is lost children. Dumoulet was a father himself. In fact, this is one of the main motivators for finishing the album. As he stated, I'm staying in LA and I'm trying to get back to my children, working as fast as I can without sacrificing the quality. Here I think we get a peek into Dumoulet's mind and motivation. So when he says things like he only raps to make money, he doesn't mean that he's trying to get nice cars and jewelry, he's got a family to take care of. Dumoulet's son Malachi was born just before Doom and Madlib started working on this album, so he's far from home with an infant to get back to. By the way, Dumoulet had a total of five children, which considering how expensive kids are, sure, I mean, I think I get it. He's rapping to get money to provide for his family, but at the same time, Doom describes himself as a writer and he's trying to write a classic book that you'll wanna recommend to someone. He meticulously writes and rewrites, trying to make the most interesting formation of words possible. He's a master of his craft, but at the same time, he needs to get paid. Speaking of writing, Fancy Clown features Victor Vaughn, another Doom character. He's a younger fan of Doom. His girl has cheated on him with Doom. So yeah, this kind of gets meta, but it's fun to see Doomily rap as someone else 
saying he's going to beat Doom up. And all of that over this incredible beat. <laughs> I knew you was in the round, playing all innocent, hoeing since the foundation. Don't make me have to pound this tin crown facing and risk being jammed up like traffic inbound from spacing. Doom and Madlib both recalled the recording process of this album as very unremarkable. Madlib would be downstairs in the bomb shelter making beats, Doom would be upstairs writing rhymes, and Doom says they barely even spoke and communicated telepathically or through the music itself. This was, of course, after they worked out an additional deal for the full album. This album was primarily made at the Stone's Throw house, though Madlib made some beats, like Raid, while on a trip to Brazil. That photo I showed you from earlier, that was Madlib's setup at his hotel in Brazil. That trip would be important to this album for multiple reasons. For one, one, Madlib found samples like the telenovela song for Raid, but also because a cassette tape of much of the album was stolen from his room and leaked on the internet. This was the earlier days of the internet, so everyone thought that was pretty much it for this album. Doom and Madlib took an extended break and began working on other projects. Doom released albums as Victor Vaughn and King Ghidra. Madlib went back to jazz, releasing Shades of Blue, a remix of classic music from the Blue Note archives. In other words, Doom went and rapped to get more money, and Madlib retreated from hip hop once again. Now let's talk about the most famous song from this album. Madlib took the song Bump and Bust Stop by Thunder and Lightning from 1974. It's the hottest thing and it's on ready. its way to the top. Right there. Step up. Just those drums right there. This has been sampled many other times by artists like Tribe, Slum Village, Gangstar, and more. But Madlib took this and combined it with music from two different TV shows, like The Streets of San Francisco. and the show Ironside. It's giving you a little context. You'll hear it. Here it comes. Man. Come on. He took all of that and turned it into one of the most iconic hip hop songs of all time. There's that first intro, first TV show theme. The bump and bust stop drums. There's that piano riff from Ironside. That is probably somewhat of a travesty having me. Then he told the people you could call me your majesty. This is Madlib in top form and Doom as well. Just listen to part of his verse here. The beat is so butter. Peep the slow cutter as he uttered a calm flow. Don't talk about my mom, yo. Sometimes he rhyme quick, sometimes he rhyme slow, or vice versa. Whip up a slice of nice verse pie. Hit it on the first try, villain. The worst guy. Again, this could be its own video breaking just this song down, but the rhyme scheme is going butter, cutter, utter, and then it gets interrupted, responds by saying, don't talk about my moms, yo, and then makes that the new rhyme, matching it with rhyme slow, vice versa, whip up a nice slice of verse pie, hit it on the first try, villain, the worst guy. This is insane rhyming. It's so dense, rhymes overlapping on each other all over the place. Again, Doom is a writer and he spent time crafting this until until it was perfect. In fact, after the initial album leak, after they took a break to focus on other projects, fans started telling Doom and Madlib how much they loved the album and couldn't wait to hear the final thing. That's when they picked it back up, finishing the project, but not before Doom re-recorded all of his verses for this album. You can Google the demos if you want, but the final version of this album has Doom with a much darker tone. It's grittier, it's more raw sounding. His delivery is different, but it's also recorded on a cheap mic, so it matches the raw sounding production even better. Another iconic, often quoted Doom line comes from the next song, Great Day. Mad lays the bass like the race card, villain on the case to break shards and leave a face scarred. Groovy dude, not to prove to be rude, but this stuff is like what you might put on movie food. This almost feels like Doom accepted a challenge. Like someone said, you have to rhyme the word butter with groovy dude. And he went, great, no problem. Groovy dude, not to be rude, but this stuff is like what you might put on movie food. 
He's saying this beat is like butter, but he's taking the long way around, eloquently rhyming his way through unexpected paths to get where he's trying to go. So how do we reconcile this? Doom said he doesn't listen to hip hop and only raps for money, and Madlib was bored with hip hop and Stone's Throw really had to pull some strings to get him interested in making hip hop again. How is it that these two, a producer and MC, completely indifferent toward hip hop, ended up making one of the greatest hip hop albums of all time? I think that their indifference isn't a weakness, it's actually the secret ingredient to the whole thing. It's not a problem that needs solving, it's the answer itself. Allow me to explain. Think about the time this album came out of. It's the early 2000s. Hip hop had just been through an incredible era in the 90s, expanding out to many different subgenres, new samples, MCs competing for who has the best rhymes. There were some incredible albums during this period, many of which I cover on this channel, the rest of which are on my list. I got you. But then along with that, we have the commercialization of hip hop, the kind of music that's more about having a hit and making money than it is about the craft. I'm not here to speak ill of any songs or artists, but there's a clear distinction between these two types of hip hop. And in the early 2000s, this feels like a pinnacle moment for commercial hip hop. The combination of sampling lawsuits and the fact that music production is getting cheaper means that producers are sampling less. They can make a new beat from scratch easily without worrying about sample clearance. And hip hop is so popular in the mainstream that MCs just need a few good rhymes and a catchy hook and you've got a hit song on your hands. Made easy, no sample clearance necessary. If Doom really wanted to just make money, he should not have made Mad Villainy. Madlib is using a ton of samples and Doom is spending a lot of time crafting these rhymes. If they just wanted to make money, they should not have used samples, made catchy hooks, and called it a day. So when Doom says that he doesn't listen to hip hop, I think this is what he means. He's not listening to the subpar stuff that's getting churned out of the hip hop machine. Just after his controversial comments in that Spin article, he said this about rhyming. It's something we did as a hobby, like practicing thoughts, brain exercises, word searches, and things like that. Studying different languages, where words come from. A practice to keep your mind sharp is how we used to see it. But then it turned out to be something. If you put it to music in a rhythmic way and you know how to bring the point across, then you can turn it into something that's real profitable. I'm blessed to be part of this whole thing from this hip hop experience. This is a man who loves language, loves taking the long, eloquent way around, enjoying the way words rhyme, sound, and can mean multiple things and tie together in unique ways. In that sense, it's taking the original idea of the MC, the master of ceremonies, there to get the crowd hyped up and using rhymes to do it, and stretching it to the absolute limit. Musically, hip hop started by taking the funkiest part of a record, looping that and keeping that vibe going. This evolved into sampling, but in order to sample well, you have to know a lot of music and know what kinds of things you like and don't like. That way you know what to grab as an ingredient to make something new. What I love about the craft of sample-based production is that to do it well, you have to know a lot of other non-hip hop music. By having a deep love and appreciation for all music, you can pull from anything and make a hip hop beat out of it. That's why a beat can be so powerful. It's not just a beat. It contains within it multiple other sources with their own history, their own feel, their own energy, and it's being made into something new. And that's why all the commercial, non-sample based stuff from the early 2000s feels so empty. It's not just about making a beat. It's about having a deep love and appreciation for music in general and making a hip hop beat out of that. That's why this album feels the way it does. Madlib loves a wide variety of music and listens with open ears. He approaches his productions with respect for the music that he's sampling. I'm gonna come back to this in just a moment, but let's talk about the final song on the album, Rhinestone Cowboy. This was the last track recorded for this album. We see both of these ideas at play on this song. Doom explains what they came to do, to have the game locked in a cage getting shocked with a pole. The second verse talks about the album leak on the internet, and then he says, Curses, these truly worships with enough rhymes to spread throughout the boundless universes. Let the beat blast, you told them where the mask, you said you best your sweet ass. Made a fine chrome alloy, find them on the grind, he's the rhinestone cowboy. Rhinestone Cowboy is a song by Glenn Campbell. He compares his fame to a cowboy covered in rhinestones, and Doom is doing the same thing. He's getting paid, he's got all the fame and jewels, etc. but where can you find him? On the grind. 
Seems like a contradiction, but Doom's not retiring and taking it easy now that he has money. He loves the art of rhyming, and yes, money and fame come with that. This is all over a Mad Lib beat that has multiple Brazilian samples. So how is their indifference toward hip hop the key to this album? Let's separate the idea of hip hop as an art form and hip hop the genre of music. The commercial radio friendly stuff that was dominating in the late 90s and early 2000s, again, I'm not knocking it, it has its place, but that's hip hop the genre. Hip hop the art form is about the love of music and the love of rhyming. Some of the most musically knowledgeable people in the world are great hip hop producers. DJ Premier, Q-Tip, Jay Dilla, Pete Rock, Mad Lib. The music coming out of them is often hip hop, but the music going in, that could be absolutely anything. That's the magic of hip hop production. And that's why Mad Lib's indifference toward hip hop made this album so good. He was more focused on jazz or Brazilian music or random TV show themes or anything else. And by getting away from hip hop, the genre, it brought him closer to hip hop, the original art form. It's a celebration of music of all kinds, sampling at the highest level possible. And that's why Doom's indifference toward hip hop made this album so good. He was there to make money, yes, but he's also there to enjoy the English language. Enjoy figuring out how do you get from groovy dude to butter, or slipped like Freudian, played yourself like an accordion. By getting away from hip hop, the genre, it brought him closer to hip hop, the art form, a celebration of language rhyming at the highest level possible. This album is a classic, revered as one of the best of all time, because Mad Villain isn't focused on beats and rapping. They're focused on music and rhymes. And isn't that, at its core, what hip hop is? Do me a favor, if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button, and if you haven't subscribed to the channel, hit that button too. Then to keep going down the MF Doom rabbit hole, check out the story of his debut album, Operation Doomsday. The formation of the Doom character, and how that whole album might be one big trick. You can watch that right here. And don't forget, just remember all caps when you spell the man name.